Hello, and welcome to the webinar, The Future of Finance, AI, Automation, and the Strategic CAO. My name is Eric Wallace with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have a few administrative details to share with you, and we'll turn things over to our panel. First, we'd like to thank Workday for their partnership with today's event. They've been wonderful partners to Argyle, and they're committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. Thank you again to Workday. We appreciate you joining us today. We welcome you to stay connected during today's event. For those of you who are active tweeters, please follow us on Twitter at Argyle Exec Forum, and be sure to follow Argyle on LinkedIn for special announcements. I also wanted to take a moment to touch on our content neutrality policy, which we've curated based on the feedback we've received over the years from our members. We've worked closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today, and we appreciate our members' support of this policy. For those of you who are seeking CPE credit today, you must answer at least three polling questions and remain on the session for its duration. Polls can be found under the Polls tab on the right-hand side of your console, right next to Chat. Afterwards, if you're eligible to receive credit, you will receive an email with a link to your certificates. If you have any questions about credits, please email cpe at argyleforum.com. Finally, and most importantly, we want to hear from you, so please submit all questions that come up during today's event into the chat section of the interface. Following the discussion, we've set aside time for our speakers to weigh in on your questions. The learning objectives for today's event are gain insight into new ways of working with innovative financial management technology, understand the new skills and competencies required in the next 36 months, which are analytics, a focus on metrics and KPIs, taking advantage of AI and ML technologies in the finance function, and maintaining a growth mindset. Unfortunately, Mike Conway, Chief Accounting Officer at Brown & Brown, will not be able to join us today. So let's begin with introductions of our two speakers before we get into our questions. Um, Philippa, can you please introduce yourself and then we'll have Karen? Hi, I'm Philippa Lawrence. I am the Chief Accounting Officer at Workday. Hi everyone, Karen Schreiber. I'm a partner in KPMG's Finance Transformation Practice. Great, welcome Karen and Philippa. It's great to have both of you here today. So let's begin with our first question, which is, what transformational objectives have CAOs achieved to date and what is next? Karen, can you lead us off with that question, please? Sure, Eric, that's a great question. When I think about the record to report process, which is very near and dear to the chief accounting officer's heart, it comes down to some basic components. One, they're using robotics process automation for some of those routine transactional tasks. They're leveraging anomaly detection so looking upstream at the data to detect whether or not the combination of what's recorded is actually correct. They're leveraging cloud ERP to drive the, fi the financials processes. And then they're leveraging AI. So th the new concept now is artificial intelligence and how can we leverage it to drive greater insights and predictive capabilities. But also we're starting to see use cases around investor communication analytics. So really looking at how your peers and competitors are portraying their results to the analysts and comparing the word choices that your peers and competitors are using to how you're using it to see if they're using words more frequently that get a positive reaction versus you used it less and not getting as positive a reaction. Great, thank you. Philippa, what do you think? I think as I listen to Karen that I recognize a lot of places where I where we are as a as a finance team. Um, I think what she's say she's saying about the the Q and the K is incredibly exciting. Um, we're not there now. I'm I'm pretty sure not a lot of people are there right now either. But just thinking about the possibilities of what AI can do for us in the future is nothing short of amazing and i can't wait until that actually happens great let's continue so what skills and competencies do finance teams need philip can you please lead us off with this question yeah thank you um so when i think about the skills and the competence competencies i i need for my finance team and just generally the competency that's needed within finance it's become very obvious that we need technology savvy um, people to join our teams, to be able to take advantage of the AI, 
And as we as we lean in and we start building these programs and we and, and we bring in AI into our processes, as the mundane is handled for handled by our AI, what are accountants doing? Well, they're leaning into more analytics, into understanding the numbers and telling the story behind the numbers and partnering with our business and having real impact on what the on what the business is doing where they're working um, and those are the competencies that that we're looking at and leaning into Thank you Karen what do you think of that question so I love Philippa's response the only other thing I'd add into it is really around business acumen so really understanding the business your industry how your peers and competitors are doing, when I'm working with a client, if they're a manufacturing or consumer products, I actually make my teams go take a plant tour. I really want them to understand at the grassroots what my clients, what they make, how they make it, why they do what they do, so that when they actually look at the numbers, they're able to tell that story. They're able to leverage when the technology spits out an answer. They're able to validate that it's real and right based on what they know about the business and what where the industry is going. You. Let's continue. So this is, this is another question for Philippa to take the lead on. What can finance leaders do to increase data analytics proficiency? Thank you. So when I think about this, I think about what it's like learning anything. And it's being allowed to, to be in a safe space to learn. And so as leaders, we need to create that safe space for our teams to learn how to become more proficient in analytics. Um, and one of the key items that I, ever, I always look at and I've been told to look at is the whys, the three whys. Why, why, why? Like peeling off an onion. And if you look at data and you go why, and then you go further and you go further, it should give you the answer of what the underlying reason is for the movement of data. However, that was great when I was a little younger uh, in my career. But as I've gone on and I've experienced it for myself, I felt like I've had to add in like three more whys just to really, really understand what's going on. And then I think, Karen, you mentioned it in the last question, which was understanding the business. So not only do you ask why it happens, but you've got to connect it with what's happening in the business. And if you don't connect it with what's happening in the business, those whys could take you off in the wrong direction. So I think those are some of the, the skills that I think about when I'm thinking about becoming really good at analytics. You, Karen, what do you think? What can finance leaders do to increase data analytics proficiency? So for those who have never done it before, training. There's a lot of programs, online courses that you can take that just give you an overview. They give you sample practice questions, sample tests. So really the whole this data literacy in learning, taking some online courses, flip as example of leaning in, ask to take on an ana analysis or a model for your boss to see if you can come up with what the answers might be. Practice, practice, practice will help you get better at it. If you've never done it before, it's okay to fail, but then you learn something from it and then you try again and you try differently. It's the best way to learn. Great, thank you. Let's continue. And, and, and Eric, if I might add on to what Karen has said, and I was thinking about what she was saying and she answered, you know, you keep learning and keep learning, but there is stuff that, I, there's data that I look at and I start analyzing again, and I would call myself proficient at data analytics, but then I have to start looking and thinking again. So it's it's a new day every time when you look at a new set of data, and it's just having that confidence to just keep going into it until you really, really understand what's happening behind it. Great, thank you. Let's have Karen take the lead on our next question, which is... What do you need to do to get started with automating repetitive and rules-based tasks? Well, the first thing I would say is make sure you have a streamlined process to begin with. You never want to automate a process that's not streamlined. You're just, it's similar to garbage in, garbage out, bad process. All it does is automate a bad process. It doesn't get you any efficiencies. So start with a clean process. Look where it is repeatable. Look to where you're automating that everything is following that simplified process. And then if there is an exception, exception, then you need to go look at upstream. What is the root cause? Try and go fix that upstream so that the rules engine can actually continue to learn. 
but don't automate every exception if it could be fixed upstream because that's we always want to say go fix it at the source. Great. Thank you. Philippa, what do you think? Well, I'm going to add on to this and to a bit of structure. So when I start automation and what I have done at Workday is set up a team, we're working on a zero day close initiative. And so I have a team called zero day close team. And what they do is they've analyzed and structured the entire project of where I want to get to. And then with that in mind, you can see all of these automations start fitting into the bigger picture. What I've experienced in my past is people go off and start automating um, tasks, but it's really hard to figure out how it, how it fits into the overall picture. So here we just um, started with the big picture so that it can bring everybody into an alignment and having everyone going in the same direction. Well, Philippa, that's a great point, because if you start with the end in mind and knowing what you want the final outcome to be, you don't end up with a bunch of partial automated pro uh, processes that don't actually end up connecting in, in the back end versus understanding how it fits into the bigger picture. Love that example. Let's continue. The next question is for Philippa to take the lead on, and that is, how can we create better alignment between IT and finance teams? I think it starts with communication, ends with communication, and in the middle, it's communication. Ah, that's a better way of saying communication, communication, communication. So what do I mean from that? I mean that when you have an idea of what you want to automate or what your goal is, it's great to have that idea, but you know you're never going to get there without IT and vice versa. So going together with the idea, discussing it together, being collaborative, listening to, oh, perhaps there's a different way or perhaps, okay, this was my goal, but maybe if we adjust it, it's easy for IT and we get to the same place or maybe just slightly different. It's that teamwork, it's the collaboration and the communication that's going to get us both there at the same time and realize all these automations. What do you think? How can we create better IT finance alignment? Well, I love Philippa's comment on communication. That's number one. But I think the other thing is also trust. Recognizing that if you're in finance, your IT counterpart, they're your partner. So trust them. Work together. Listen to each other's ideas so that you can come up with a holistic, better solution together. Some of the parts greater than the whole. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to our next question. And that is, what should we keep in mind as we introduce machine learning and artificial intelligence? Karen, can you lead us off on that one, please? Wow, that's a great question. You know, if you had asked me this six months ago, eight months ago, five years ago, I would have said, oh, we're never going to get to AI replacing things. We have seen such a growth in AI in the last six months, generative AI. We really now need to be thinking that we have governance in place. We have controls in place. We have guiding principles in place. There still has to be those guardrails. We can't just let AI run its course because we've already seen in the news some dangerous aspects and use of it. If you're talking about predictive analytics where you're using statistical modeling, that's great. But where you're starting to see it for other purposes and uses, that's where the governance, the controls really need to be there. Remember, when the internet first came out, and now we have everything that's out there. You can't always believe everything that's published on the internet. Similarly with AI, we need those guardrails to keep control over what the output is. So I'm going to add to that, if I may, if you don't mind, Eric, that I, I, I think you quoted it earlier on. It's garbage in, garbage out again, which is how clean is your data? And so I think about in my company, if my data is not clean and organized, then any AI you put on top or anything you do with it, you're gonna have to ex expect rubbish coming out of it. So putting my my controls, putting um, change management controls around, around this data will help make the AI that pops out and what it's telling us to do more reliable and more trustworthy. So that's how I think about it. Great, thank you. So the next question is, how can we address concerns that AI will take over our jobs in finance? Karen, can you uh, can you address this pressing concern for us, please? Yeah. So I don't actually think they're going to take them over completely. I think there will be parts of our jobs that will be replaced with AI. 
But as we think about our overall business model, our overall organizational construct, we do have combinations today. We've got offshore capability. We've got people working from home. We've got people who are executives and we've got robotics that have already automated specific parts of processes. AI is just a way to automate further additional capabilities. So think about a maturity curve. When outsourcing came about, the first thing that people thought about outsourcing was accounts payable or payroll. But as they got better, as the providers got better, we moved up the maturity curve to take advantage of other capabilities. No different as AI, start, AI starts to take over certain components, the finance professional will have to continue to enhance their skill set. So instead of doing the work, they're going to review the work. Instead of cranking the numbers, they're going to do the interpretation and the so what and what are we going to go do about it components. It frees up that capacity. I don't think it'll overall replace all of finance. And and I've been in finance or in accounting for 35 years, and I couldn't be more excited about this because I think about my my career, I've spent so much time reconciling numbers that should reconcile, doing data input, all things that I knew I was trained to do better, but you, if you can't get that right, you can't do the higher level work. And thinking that I'm going to have AI come along and do all of that work for me and that allows me to step into the space I was trained for, that I get excited about, that I can help the business. I, I just love the idea. Um, I also don't believe it's going to take everything away from us either. I just look on AI as like a co-worker uh, that's going to do all the stuff I didn't really want to do in the first place. And so I I, I just can't wait. I am, I'm so excited about technology and the way we're way that we're going. Thank you. Let's continue. The next question is, how can finance leaders tell if candidates for employment have a growth mindset? Philippa, can you lead us off on that question, please? Yeah, it's an interesting one. And, and I ask a question when I'm interviewing people that once I pay attention to body language and the answer helps me put people in categories of growth or non-growth mindseted people. Um, so my, my question generally is, is, if I was your manager and I give you something that you have never done before and you don't really know, like, what do you do? And then you just watch. <laughs> if someone stops, then probably they're not, you know, stops for a while and, and it's not just thinking, it's just, oh gosh, what do I do? Probably not in that growth mindset. But if someone starts then start thinking about, oh, how can I solve it? This is what I will do. Then I, I think that's a growth mindset and they're the people I want to work with. I want people that can go out, not really knowing exactly what they're doing, but they know how to solve it and they want to solve it. And so they're the people I want to work with. Philippa, that's a great, great example. I have a different question that I use from a growth mindset. I always like to ask the people that I'm looking to hire is, tell me about your greatest challenge and how did you overcome it? And when I ask that question, it's very open-ended because I'm looking for how far back did they have to go to figure out what their biggest challenge is? If they're telling me a story from 10 years ago, they probably haven't grown much. If they tell me a story of something that happened within the last year, that shows how they are continuing to evolve. And they tell me now what they've changed as they move forward. And it can be a soft skill, it could be a technical skill, but it is something a way for me to articulate and understand from them how they are actually growing. Great, thank you. Let's continue with the next question. And that is, how can we make the business case for increased and sustained investment in automation? Karen, can you uh, take the first swing at this one, please? Sure, Eric. It's interesting. Every company, when they embark on investment in technology, does a business case. They do the ROI, the net present value, the IR, all of that. Spend a lot of time on it. Build it bottoms up, try to get the business to get a lot of buy-in. Here's the problem. They deliver. They never go back and actually measure, did they achieve the success that was defined in the business case? So one of the things that we think about is you should always do a business case, especially for large dollar investments, but you also need to put the measurement in place. And then what happens is with that savings, then you can decide how you take that and reinvest it in further additional automation opportunities or other things that are important for your organization. And the sustainment is because we ask people to measure the business case ROI at three months, six months, 12, 
18 to make sure you've actually sustained it out of the organization. And and Eric, I find that that I'm, I'm smiling a lot because I think I fall into that category an awful lot where we, we do a great business case. You've got a great ROI you, and, and, and you go ahead with the project. And I've, I've done the project and I have led and I've been responsible for those projects. And then you're like, hey, team, you told me you're going to save 300 hours. So I think we don't need as many resources as we thought. And it's like, oh, no, but, but it's just disappeared. So I really think it's important to keep an eye on the results from anything you've done. And then it can increase your um, your comfort in going further and investing more. And I think that's super important. Thank you. Let's continue. This next question is, what are you going to do with all the time that automation frees up? <laughs> I've already planned for this. <laughs> and the answer is anything you really want to do. So I look at it, but if it's work, which of course it will be, it'll be, okay, you've done all that. I think I've repeated it, but you've done all the stuff I didn't want to do anyway. So now I can, I can lean in and do my analytics, my business partnering, understand the economics of the business more and maybe find a different market we can go into or whatever you want to do. And if it takes you from 10 hours a day to eight hours a day, then I think you can start looking forward to a cookery class and learning how to cook for the rest of the family and um, finding other hobbies. Because the answer to this is, it's going to give us great work-life balance. And that's what's exciting about it. I couldn't have said it better myself, Philippa. Thank you all for a wonderful discussion. Just as a reminder, audience members can still enter questions. And now we're going to review some of the questions that have been submitted by the audience. The first question is, we are struggling to make sense of all our automation options. Do you have any advice for us? Yes. Start with a prioritization. So what's the criteria that you want to deliver value back to the organization? So everyone is creative, throws out ideas. Oh, we can automate this. We can automate that. But let's start where either it will eliminate or reduce from 50 people down to 30 people worth of work and you've freed up that capacity. Don't start automating something that only one or two people do. You're not going to get the value on the back end of it. That's number one. Number two, also look to where you can actually add greater value to your, if you're in finance, to your business partners in the organization. How do you better help them through greater ways of automating, whether it's giving them access to their to the data themselves, or it's real-time reporting, or it's engaging in conversations with them in a more frequent capacity because the AI has done the PowerPoint, PowerPoint creation for you. Now it comes back to what Philip and I were talking about earlier around the storytelling. That's where it's going to be is those creation tasks are going to be done by the machines, and it's the human factor now that's about the interaction and the communication. Thank you, Philippa, what do you think? How do, what's, what's a guide for the perplexed on you know, the automation options? Well, I'm gonna to defer to Karen on that because she said everything that we've actually been working through ourselves, which is just trying to figure out, you get hundreds of ideas and maybe, Maybe it's not exactly hundreds, but it feels like hundreds of ideas of we can do this, we can do that, we can do that. And and we we're going through it and looking looking for those ones that will give us the biggest bang for our buck, I think is the the expression. Um and then trying out and you know what's really interesting is there are multiple technologies that can get you there. And so if you've got a big project, go out and look at the technology and figure out which one's going to work, not only on this task with you, but all the other ones that you're thinking about, because it's nice to just get one size fits all, but maybe, you know, or at least two or three. Um, and so that's what we're working through. We've got some big, big goals, and, and we're going out and looking at other technologies that might actually just work for us, um, and, and keeping our mind open to whatever's out there on the market. Great, thank you. So what's the biggest mistake you've seen companies make in automating their accounting functions and how did they get past it? So I was gonna start because I think Karen has already given this answer, which is 
you know, automating tasks that haven't been streamlined and well thought of. And I think, I, I think in accounting, you know, it, it there's very much homegrown processes that if you came back with a fresh eye, you're like, why do we do it that way? Because there's a better way to do it. Automating the as is, is never the right solution. You, you need to come back, you need to think about your processes and talk about the whole, the, the holistic process. And also the idea, and I keep saying it, automation, that might be old timey thinking as well. We should think about things differently of what AI can actually do for us. And it actually requires us of thinking a little bit differently about our processes as well. Karen. I agree. I, I, you're, you're spot on. The old, let, let's just automate the process. AI might give you a more creative way to do it. And it's going to continue to change as AI learns more, as more data is fed into it, it's going to come up with very different, more creative, innovative solutions that we are going to have to continue to learn to stay, uh, keep up to date with it. Great. So how do you both think the accounting field is going to evolve over the next couple of years? Yeah, this is this is going to be an interesting one. Um, I actually think, and Philip and I have talked about this on a previous webcast, we think accounting and finance is going to come closer together. I think the skills of what used to be segregation of close the books, tick and tie, to the planning and the analytic side of it, because the routine is going to get automated, because the repeatable may be so streamlined, so now the insight, the analytics is going to become that much more important. But I also don't want to lose sight of, I do believe that professionals are going to still have to learn the art of communication, the art of negotiation, and the art of storytelling. I don't think that's going to ever go away because you still have to be able to interpret what it says. Well, what do you think? Well, I, 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 I agree. And I look at it as, there's a shift between work between FP&A and, and accounting. And as that stuff drops off, as the repeatable drops off, we step into the world that FP&A is in. And that's okay for FP&A people who are listening, because that gives you a greater time to do all that other analytics work that you never get round to. We're just going to take some work off you to help you move into a more important space. And that is going to have accountants moving into those analytics. And it comes around to the storytelling and and you can't underestimate the ability to tell a story to someone who's not in finance and not talk debits and credits to them, but tell them the story behind the number, how it impacts the business and how perhaps we can do business a little bit differently to be more profitable or to, do, to, to, to just get better KPIs, whatever you want to do. Don't ever underestimate the ability to do that. And I and I really see that accountants move away from that very hardcore, you debit this, you credit that, to that. I'm now explaining what's going on in the business. And it's just, you know, it's you started off and said it's interesting. I'm sure everybody that's listening to this is like, it's interesting. It's a whole new world. And just like generations before us, we're going to step into a whole new world. And it's a little scary, but it's not that scary. And we just need to go in and we need to keep evolving our profession. And that's how I see it. Thank you. This next question is, how do you orchestrate human and AI workers working together to create shareholder value? Eric, that's a great question. And I think it's something that many organizations are going to start to embrace and figure out. So when you think about an organizational construct, there are some very strategic, futuristic, required capabilities that both a human and AI from a predictive capability, we need to bring them together. There's the combination of AI being a coworker. There's the combination of our offshore team being a coworker, our nearshore team as a coworker, and all of our day-to-day -day onshore teams. And how you make that interaction model having the right resource, and when I say resource, I do am including AI and machine learning, making sure we've got the right responsibilities aligned to the right people and how they all interact to drive that ultimate shareholder value and the right outcomes is going to be critical. And companies are starting to work through it and think through it. I think it'll evolve over time. 
I don't think there's a perfect answer yet because we're still learning. And because AI and machine learning are growing so rapidly in such short periods of time, I think we're going to have to continue to work through that interaction model and how we leverage all of our coworkers to drive the ultimate outcome for our, our businesses. Yeah, and Karen, I think you nailed it because that's how we think about it at Workday when we're talking about AI is just another coworker. It's another workmate, as we like to call them at Workday, that's going to help us, you know, just do our work better. And, and you know, you can, the bots that are out there, you can give them names if you want to. I really believe that they're coworkers. And so, I don't know, throw out the name Jeremy you can do your accruals and that will be really nice. And, it, and that's genuinely how we're thinking about it as we plan and we implement at Workday. So next question is, what do we need to do to raise the next generation of accountants? Wow. So this, this is an interesting one um, because we all learned by doing. We sat in a project room. We had our managers and our other bosses above us all in a project room where we could do the work, had a question, you reached over it, you tapped them on the shoulder and said, hey, can I ask you a question? I need some help. And we're not doing a lot of that anymore. A lot of us are in a hybrid work environment. So it's how do you get that camaraderie, that team building, recognizing that the next generation who is now with the advent of AI and ML, they're not gonna necessarily get the opportunities to do they're going to have to learn how to review. So some of that additional training, some of the additional soft skills training are going to become very, very important for them to continue to learn in their career path. Same page. If you're coming to me, Eric, I'm thinking exactly the same way. Um, and I think it's a lot of what we've all, all, all discussed. It's the, the soft skills, the analytics. And, and, being able to collaborate and partner, I think those are, are very important skills of our next future accountants. Great, thank you. So I assume the field is changing a lot. Then, so what does the career path look for, look like for accountants now? For someone who's new to the field. Okay, I'm going to answer this, and I I would think that the the path is the same as it always is. I mean. It's just the way you're getting there is different because account, the accounting field and having been in it for 35 years is a fascinating field to be in and I've loved it. And But I could have gone many different routes. And I don't think that, that AI is going to really change my route. It's just going to make things easier in whatever I choose to do. So if I want to start in auditing, I can imagine that AI is going to make auditing completely different as well. Same skill set you're going to need, the, the higher level, the more analytical, the partnering with your customer, your client is going to be important. And then I think I, I went from audit and then I went into industry. And so now I'm reconciling payroll. Actually, that was one of my first jobs was reconciling a payroll account, which honestly took me about five days. If I have AI, maybe it's done in two minutes and then I can go on and do the fun stuff. And trust me, reconciling payroll was not fun. And then as I think, as I go on, I, I did due diligence. And you think about how AI can help me with due diligence, with the numbers that I'm receiving from the, the target and how I can analyze it quicker and look for anomalies that would probably take me, I don't know, a few hours or maybe a few days, depending on the anomaly. Now you've got AI helping you, but my path is very similar. It's just the skill sets that I'm using are different. And I am partnering with my coworker AI to get myself into these different opportunities. And so that's how I think about it. I don't know, Karen, how you think about it, but as I've only been an accountant my, my whole life, but I've done most of the accounting stuff, I don't see that that changes much in the future. I agree with you, Philip. I, I, I think the work will be done faster and you'll get to do different things. So I go back to when I was a young consultant, I did a lot of spreadsheet jockeying, a lot of VLOOKUPs, a lot of data sorting yeah. and slicing. And now with the technology, it'll do it for me. So I actually get to spend the time thinking through for my client's business, what does this mean? So I can make better, more strategic decisions 
to help them drive greater outcomes versus spending all the time crunching the numbers and figuring out potentially I only have 10 minutes to do the analysis versus I now have a whole day to do it. Yeah, and maybe you don't have to pull all-nighters anymore. That's Remember right. the all-nighters? Maybe the AI will get us out of those all-nighters. I and hope so, because that would be great. Questionable food at three o'clock in the morning. Very questionable food. <laughs> Thank you. So the next question is, what's your advice for future accounts? You know, I think, I think everybody's a little nervous on truly what does this do to our workforce? How do we retain them? Um and finding other opportunities, creative value-added things. Think about our generational gap. Young professionals coming yeah. from undergrad are all about yeah. the here and now. So they're excited about this automation. The flip side yeah. is the instant gratification. So if AI is doing it, what are they gonna do and how do they start to add value? Because remember, they don't know the business, they don't know the industry, they don't necessarily know all of the 50 years worth of knowledge that someone who comes before them has. So I think it's a, I still think it's a very real concern. So how do you take care of like that um, emotional side of our employees? I mean, emotional is not the right side, but. No, I think it's right. I think you're right. It's emotional. And I think it's a very, um, a, a very real um, fear that we can, we can talk about um, I don't have any answers of how you do it other than I'm I'm just going on the path seeing what happens. I'm like kind of excited personally and I'm I'm arguably at the end of the workforce. Myself as well. I mean and so I'm just I'm happy, but if I was coming into the workforce, I'd be just building on skills and wanting to do the best for the business. And maybe accountants sort of gets merged with FPA. Yes. But the business are always business. They're always wanting to, I don't know, make profits, invest in people, invest in technology and and deliver something great to the world. And so that's always going to happen and they're always going to need people who are looking at numbers. And so that's, I think, that's how I feel comfortable about it. The, the question of, I think is a really interesting one is that, you know, the, the younger people coming in it, the new generation coming into the workforce are a lot more um, microwave version of things. They want things, uh, instant gratification, they want things straight away and they want it more. And I think that AI is going to play into that. And so I think as we go on in future, I think we're going to, I don't know, the close is probably not even going to be a thing. And we're going to have, instead of doing core trends, maybe we have constant data going out to our to our. Um, shareholders and people look at data differently and they expect it quicker. Now, I, I I actually don't really know, but I do think it's kind of exciting, like the evolution. And you take it back, I was watching the TV uh, yesterday and watching like lamp lighters that used to go in at the turn of the century and light the lamps. No one would have known that electricity would change right. everybody's jobs. And that's where we're at right now. We're at a turning point that this is just one of those electrification type opportunities in life and, and nothing's going to be the same after this. And we're just lucky to be here at the beginning. You're right. I mean, I, I, I'm sitting here going, wow. I, as you said, I'm at towards the tail end of, of my career. And it's exciting to see because I look at our young professionals who've just graduated, I look at my niece and nephew and the opportunities that they're going to have, the jobs that they're going to have that don't even exist today because the world is going to change. And that's really exciting for them. And, you know, we'll be the old dinosaurs at, at the tail end and looking at all the creative things that they get to do. And I really think it's exciting. I look forward to seeing it. Um, yeah, and you look, if you look 100 years, you look 50 years, and you look at the technology changes just in our everyday life. Yeah. We haven't been frightened of that. We've like, maybe there's been early adopters and then then the mass adopts the technology. But this is not this is not nothing different. It's no. just we're at a different place and it's gonna be great. I know. I mean, think about it. We grew up, we had landline phones. Yeah. I mean now I we have a computer in our hands. Exactly. And that's truly in the last, you know, 30 plus years. I mean, when I started in, in consulting, 
is just when cell phones were coming out. Thank you, Philippa and Karen, for that insightful session. This concludes today's webinar, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this fantastic virtual event, and thank you again to our partner Workday, and enjoy the rest of your day.